Hi, my name is Clemo Mowa, working for GRC, and very pleased to be here today to present you a new methodology for long-term monitoring of forest color changes in the humid tropics. The data that will be presented here today um, is fully available in Google Earth Engine and through the TMF Explorer, which is a website where you can visualize, uh, interact, and download the data. The data spans from 1990 to 2020 at 30 meter spatial resolution. Um, and the whole study behind this has been published this year in Science Advances. So you should go have a look if you need more information on the methodology or in, on the results. Uh, here I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the methodology. Uh, the first step is single day classification. So every single image of the Landsat archive is analyzed and classified. Uh, into potential moist forest cover, potential disruption area, which is an area with an absence of tree foliage, and invalid um, observation. Analyzing every single date images allow capturing short duration events, such as selective logging, but also characterize precisely the disturbances in terms of timing, in terms of intensity, which is the number of total observation of disruption, and recurrence, which is the frequency of the disturbances. It also allow uh, to better track regrowth, such as reforestation or afforestation. In a second step, uh, those uh, single date classifications are analyzed uh, through time. So the temporal sequence of those classification um, allow to first identify the extent of the TMF domain and then identify transition classes, which are forest dynamics trajectories. And those trajectories are further refined in a third step and this whole transition map is then broken down into annual change maps, which help document the extent of the TMF every year and to document the, the appearing of, uh, of uh, new disturbances every year. Um, here I'm going to uh, emphasize on one process of interest here, so forest degradation, which is the observation of disturbances, both natural and anthropogenic, over a short time period. Uh, uh, which is defined by the threshold of three years. So everything, all the disturbances over, observed over less than three years will be classified as forest degradation. And we have two types of degradation, short duration. Uh, so the disruptions last between zero and one year, and then long duration, it's between uh, one and two and a half years. So for example, logging in a logging area, as you can see here, you can recognize the pattern of logging. Um, in green light, you can see um, logging uh, gap, for example, in this in in this place. Uh, two disruptions were observed in 1996 out of the four valid observation, and then it was classified as first. So this is a short duration degradation, whereas long duration, for example, in a fire and a burn forest here happened between 2015 and 2018. The fire leaves the longer scar in the first um, uh, the, the canopy structure, and therefore we can analyze and identify those disruptions over a longer time. So those two examples are single step degradation, but we can also have uh, several steps degradation, for example, logging that is followed by a reco forest recovery and then by fire, for example. So those several steps can also be analyzed within our data. And we can also uh, identify degradation that, that will be then uh, deforestation. So a degraded forest that will then be deforested later on. And this is very important because 45% of uh, the detected uh, degradation will then be deforested. So which highlights the, the, the importance of really well defining and tracking degradation as it is a precursor of deforestation. Regarding forest regrowth, so it's two-phase transition from first one moist forest to deforested land and then to vegetative regrowth. And we need at least three years duration of permanent moist forest cover um, to classify the forest, the, the pixel as regrowth in order to avoid confusion with agriculture. So here, uh, we can distinguish uh, different regrowth ages. So uh, all regrowth where deforestation happened in the 90s and then it's classified as forest and uh, on the right hand, young regrowth where deforestation happened in around 2008 and then it's classified as forest. We also distinguish reforestation to afforestation and uh, water to forest regrowth. 
Here I wanted to point out two main uh, known limitations uh, that will be improved in next years. The first one is that disturbances less than 0.09 hectare in size are not fully captured. For example, small scale selective logging. So the integration of Sentinel to imageries with higher temporal and spatial resolution will be key for addressing this issue. You can see uh, the, this example in Central Africa here. On the left, you have TMF, which uh, identifies the main uh, logging roads, the main logging decks, but the FCDM approach uh, on the right hand can uh, capture finer um, events such as uh, canopy opening, so logging gaps and other smaller roads. So this gives you an idea of why we need uh, higher temporal and spatial resolution for this purpose. The second limitation is that degradation is uh, for now, only characterized by temporal metrics the, uh, through the timing, duration, intensity, frequency, which and those metrics do not directly translate into a type of degradation. So we cannot um, uh, identify precisely the type of degradation, uh, such as logging, different logging practices, or fires, or we cannot distinguish anthropogenic to natural disturbances. So this. Uh, need for study is very important in order to, uh, to address the direct drivers of the condition or for any other applications such as carbon mass assessment or biodiversity loss assessment. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to leave you here with the two references, so the reference to the article and to our TMF Explorer and Data Access. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon everyone. My name is Mathieu de Kuiper and I'm part of the ECRAF C4 Spatial Lab uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya. As part of the research gaps and challenges in forest degradation in this workshop, I will present my ongoing work regarding continuous monitoring of forest change dynamics. I will briefly mention some of the projects I'm involved in with respect to the forest monitoring. So I'm, for example, looking at forest change dynamics and drivers of natural regeneration. This is in the context of land degradation in Ivory Coast, for example. Or I'm also involved in a project uh, that looks at the fate of secondary forests in human modified landscapes in Mexico. Uh, I'm also working at the Regreening Africa project, uh, where we mainly focus on the regrowth monitoring. And this project covers uh, eight African countries and aims to reverse land degradation. Many forest change detection methods rely heavily on the quality of fitting, so potentially smoothening out part of this interannual vegetation variability, especially in dry ecosystems, this could result in low results. They often also uh, capture only one disturbance and regrowth event, but this doesn't reflect the current situation. It also does not allow you to calculate, for example, uh, secondary forest ages. Therefore, we uh, developed a new method, which is uh, coined avocado, anomaly vegetation change detection, and it continuously monitors the forest change dynamics. We'll very briefly explain how the method works. So basically what you can see here is a time series of forest pixel that we know has always been forest. From that we uh, calculate the frequency distribution of all historical uh, records uh, and uh, so each year basically contributes to the reference curve and the confidence interval. And then you get a baseline reference curve to whom against you test the pixel of interest. For example, in panel C, you can see the black dots. From the black dots, we calculate anomalies. So the difference between observed and the most expected value and the probability of that observed value relative to the confidence interval. The algorithm works in an automatic way in flagging disturbance and regrowth. In the top panel you can see a Landsat time series of a forested pixel in Ivory Coast with a disturbance in 2011 and a regrowth in 2015. In the bottom uh, 
left panel you can see the disturbance flagging where a number of consecutive pixels uh, reach a probability threshold of over 95% while on the bottom right panel you can see the recrow detection of consecutive pixels that reach the reference boundary or above. Here you can see some of the results of the algorithm. Uh, in the top panels you can see the disturbance detection, in the bottom panels the regrowth, and of course you, uh, you have more uh, maps with the second disturbance and the second regrowth and so on. Uh, we tested this uh, algorithm in three different sites, um, just to uh, not only focus on tropical rainforests, but also look at the dry and the accuracies in dry ecosystems. Here are some examples uh, of, uh, of the sites. Here you see an example of shifting agriculture in Peru where uh, forest was converted to uh, crops and then uh, slowly regrown again. But we could also capture, for example, uh, selective logging where then cacao plants or trees were planted underneath the canopy and gradually closed again in uh, Ivory Coast. And uh, this is an example in Tanzania where uh, you see the uh, very small scale encroachment of on the forest edge. Based on this map, you can uh, create several derived products like secondary forest ages, secondary forest survival rates, uh, and so on. We are currently also exploring the use of the algorithm in the regreening Africa context. We want to set up a monitoring system to see the progress of the regreening efforts. Where does it work or not, and what lessons can we learn about this? This we do in combination with the Regreening Africa app, where uh, local people can upload their uh, data. You can imagine that, uh, especially with plantations, but also with natural regeneration, the forest regrowth is slow, and the plantations are uh, often with smaller plants. That makes it very challenging to uh, monitor this. So therefore, we are now exploring also the use of Sentinel-2 optical data and Sentinel-1 data. So these are some of these challenges, but there are also other challenges. Once we have the disturbance regrowth results, we do not know automatically what the follow-up plant use is. Is forest convert to crops or to tree plantations? Can we distinguish between natural regrowth and plantations? Scaling up is also an issue. Our algorithm is based on a nearby forest reference curve, but for large areas, we need to think of uh, classification maps with similar forest types, for example, or tiling up the area. Also, the processing part is hampering its use, and that's not only for this algorithm, but also in general. Although the pre-processing is done in Google Earth Engine, the algorithm itself still needs processing capacity. Speaking of capacity, capacity building is often also uh, needed, especially if you want uh, people in local institutes to use and, uh, the algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is open access with tutorials and dashboards, but still workshops would be essential for its use. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. Hi, my name is Orly Shapiro and I'm from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And I'll be discussing our Congo Basin Driver Study on behalf of myself and Remy D'Annunzio. The goal of the project is to develop automated, reproducible, and scalable tools to detect deforestation, degradation, and associated drivers. This is important in supporting land use planning and sustainable use of forests. We are developing a global methodology using the open source tools from Open Forest, which include Collect Earth and CPAL, which allow us to process massive amounts of satellite imagery in the cloud. All of this is reproducible, open, and transparent, and completely scalable. 
This is a global study, but it's being piloted in the six Congo Basin countries of Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. What's important for our project is to have standard definitions. So we define deforestation as a permanent reduction of forest cover that falls below the forest definition. This includes conversion of forest to other land uses such as agriculture, pasture, mineral or timber exploitation or development. It does not include areas of planned deforestation such as uh, timber extraction or selective logging where the areas are expected to regenerate naturally. It does include, however, areas where disturbances or overexploitation might prohibit regeneration over time. Degradation, on the other hand, is a temporary or permanent reduction of forest cover while staying above the forest definition. And this includes selective logging and timber extraction where forests may regenerate naturally. In order to provide wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the study area, we are using various data sources. So for the base data for 2015, we have a combination of Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2, and the gaps, as you see on the right, are filled in with ALS Pulsar. The time series data from 2015 to 2020 is also a combination of Landsat 8 and Sentinel-1. And finally, all of this is validated with planet scope data. Deforestation and degradation have different definitions, but from a remote sensing perspective, it can be difficult to discern. Uh, the example on your left shows a pixel time series um, that is deforested. On the right um, is an example of degradation. We are using high temporal resolution time series to try to detect and discern the deforestation and degradation over the entire Congo Basin region. Once we produce a wall-to-wall -wall map of deforestation and degradation over the entire region, then comes the interesting part. We're going to provide a sampling approach to detect and identify the drivers um, in a number of these different types of changes. So uh, an example here is on the right is a wall-to-wall -wall map of deforestation and degradation. And then for each of these sample areas, we would then collect um, high-resolution planite data and um, try to detect what kinds of drivers are present, for example, logging roads or cultivation. The state of the science, however, between deforestation and degradation is not really clear, and I think this is where we can highlight the major gaps. So deforestation, it's, it's pretty operational, it's standard. We can detect changes in timing, and we can validate those with high-resolution data or even on the ground. Um, all of this is pretty operational. Degradation, on the other hand, is much more complicated. We can detect canopy cover reductions and disturbances, you know, we can sometimes link those to high resolution, but there's really no consistent validation data set, and there's really no consensus on what does degradation look like on the ground. So the planet data are a major step in this direction. They provide high resolution, high spatial and temporal resolution data to really help us link the timing and the state of the forest over time, but there's really no clear way on defining what is actually degradation and quantifying it. Our objective, however, is to um, specifically identify the drivers associated with both deforestation and degradation. So based on this example from Chukavina et al. in 2018, you know, we will have a sampling approach that will identify the presence of not only single but multiple drivers you know, at different locations throughout the, the Congo Basin. And hopefully all of this will be validated with planet data so we can provide a ro robust data set on the types of changes we're seeing. This has really important implications for policy. So for example, our donor, the Central African Forest Initiative, or CAFI, is really interested in knowing what kinds of drivers or what kinds of land use decisions are driving deforestation and forest change. So you know, what kind of infrastructure can be associated with various types of change and where? An example on your right, for example, is the new brief from the Rainforest UK on the effect of logging concessions. And we can see here in this graph that the you know, forest loss rates are much different in community managed areas rather than logging concessions, and it's different than the uh, DRC average. So this helps us um, build tools and specific information to support land use planning. Thanks for your attention, and we're happy to receive any questions or comments. Good afternoon. I am Pierre Defony from UC Louvain in Belgium, and would like first to thank the co-chair for the invitation. We have been involved for 15 years in the Observatory of Central African Forest, supported by the EU and the GRC. I propose here to share some of our experiences in forest remote sensing and some challenges for forest monitoring system for and by the Congo Basin countries. The Central Africa Forest Observatory is a technical and scientific entity supporting the COMIFAC, a political body including 10 countries of the Congo Basin. 
Its mandate is to ensure the permanent availability of consolidated information on the forest. This is a reason why, as early as in 2008, in close collaboration with national experts, we develop methods to estimate the first deforestation rates at national level by remote sensing. We are currently preparing the sixth state of the forest report, aiming to consolidate all the information currently available in 2021. In addition to the observatory, the portal analytics provide online key information to all stakeholders at various administrative levels from country to protected area. Unfortunately, basic information like annual forest loss are still quite variable according to the source and cannot be delivered on the platform. This is the reason why we review recently all the key scientific sources of information about the annual forest change rate, but found major divergence between the different estimates. Of course, we all know the challenge for observing the deforestation and the degradation. On one side, these are continuous processes, while satellite instruments record snapshots of current situation. From this snapshot, it is not obvious to know whether we look at the degradation process or at the development of a secondary forest through successional phases. In addition, it's not always obvious to attribute the reason of the process to an anthropogenic or natural causes. The excellent work completed by GRC on tropical moist forests for the monitoring of disturbance dynamic is a masterpiece for the forthcoming State of the Forest report. But even so, this most detailed analysis seems to face problems when it comes to keep the label regrowth for several decades. Maybe the challenge is more conceptual. Degradation would be probably better monitored in terms of functional traits, as forest dynamics are much more than degradation and regrowth. For instance, the forest domestication is an ongoing process in our countries and we know that we won't capture that with degradation and regrowth. Most recently, Réjou Méjean published a very nice uh, paper related to the functional trait describing the key forest type in the Congo Basin. Three key traits would describe all of them, wood density, deciduousness, and maximum potential height. Unfortunately, R&D are still much needed when we look at these functional traits like biomass product for the basin where the product bias dominate the diversity between countries. More importantly, even the forest extent at national scale is still very variable from the different sources, with a coefficient of variation ranging from few percent to 100%. This is the reason why the OFAC countries decide to map the forest type to harmonize the extent, to concept, contextualize the forest disturbance, and possibly assess policy impact. The initiative led to a technical harmonization of a regional forest typology defined using LCCS, thanks to several national expert workshops. It also led to the political endorsement by the COMIFAC for a regionally harmonized typology compatible with national ones. Furthermore, collaboration with major projects like the CAFI study on deforestation driver has been key to ensure compatibility. Today, we are producing forest type map for the different Congo Basin countries, like this one on the Congo, where we can have a set of forest type distributed over the national territory. Of course, this effort is facing technical challenges like image availability due to cloud coverage, and this is true for the coastal countries, but also atmospheric correction introducing artifact due to the very low reflectance value of the Congo Basin Forest. Sentinel-1 mission is probably the only solution for various places in the Congo Basin. Quite promising results reported in the literature use forest type or land cover map to detect forest change from the full Sentinel-1 time series. 
Even more recently, a disturbance alert system was developed taking advantage of each new Sentinel-1 image to detect change. Of course, these pioneer researches need to be fine-tuned. Indeed, today, the Sentinel fleet, the open source code, and the cloud-based infrastructure made technically possible an operational forest monitoring system run by the country for the countries to ensure the continuity and, most importantly, the national legitimacy while technically supported and coordinated at regional level by the regional observatory. Last but not least challenge for the research community in this data-rich era is probably to define a consolidation process of our own scientific results in order to deliver the most reliable information to the decision maker. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Andreas Langner and I'm working at the JSG. Uh, my talk today is about operational forest degradation monitoring, and I would like to introduce you to the Forest Canopy Disturbance Monitoring Tool, or FCM tool. This first slide shows a screenshot of the graphical user interface of the FCDM tool as implemented in Google Earth Engine. On the right-hand side, you have the different parameters to, to be entered, and on the left-hand side, you see the results already here in red color. The indications of logging, um, logging roads, um, um, in, in an area here in Papua New Guinea, this data is based on a combination of Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 data. Um, the FCDM tool uh, holds two different uh, monitoring approaches. The FCDM optical approach working with Landsat and Sentinel-2. Uh, the algorithm is described in this paper. Here's a link to the paper as well as a link to the script. If you can read this here. As well as there is a FCDM radar approach developed. This has also been implemented in the FCDM tool. However, it's not yet publicly available, but it will become available once the publication will be posted. The concept of both um, FCDM approaches is the same. It's basically a change detection approach uh, process which compares two periods in time, a reference period and an analysis period. For both um, periods, all available scenes of the selected sensors are um, analyzed for their canopy conditions, accumulated, and these intermediate results are then um, further processed to um, derive the difference between them in order to get the change information. And this means if there has been no um, canopy opening in the earlier reference period, but an opening in the analysis period, we get a disturbance event. The opposite will result in a regrowth event. And if either both um, periods show an opening or show no opening, no change happens. So this is about activity data happening during the analysis period. Here a comparison of the FCDM optical and FCDM radar data here. The optical is based on Sentinel-2 data, so it also comes at a spatial resolution of 10 meters, similar to the Sentinel-1 data. The area I show you here is in Cameroon, it's a logging concession. The analysis period is the calendar year 2020, and in the background we see a planet data for visual reference at the 3 meters spatial resolution um, taken at the end of the analysis period. And we can see logging roads going through the forest, even smaller logging roads here crisscrossing these forested areas. And here we have now the result of the FCDM optical um, approach. So we see it's nicely taking the logging roads and it's also taking signal, so we're giving a signal which most probably refer to signal tree extractions in vicinity to these logging roads. However, <clears throat> FCDM um, shows signal from roads uh, where it turned out these roads have already been established before the, um, um, before the analysis period, so therefore should not show up, but this um, relates to the, the detection approach. For the FCDM radar approach, the result basically look similar. We have, however, here more signal in the central part. You see the logging roads as well. 
we see these parts which have been established before did not show up and we see even more um, um, more detection of single tree extractions. So to compare both approaches, we have on the one hand side, of course, for the optical working with the Landsat 4578, as well as Sentinel-2. So this optical approach, of course, is problematic in areas of frequent cloud cover. The radar approach, as it is based on radar Sentinel-1 data, it's independent of cloud cover as radar can look through clouds. The approach here um, is sensitive towards bare soil <clears throat> and non-photosynthetic vegetation. That's also the reason why these, um, these existing logging roads, which were reopened again, showed up here, but did not show up with a radar-based approach, which go for structural changes, meaning the extraction of trees, which were already extracted on these already existing roads. Therefore, we have here the restriction of the applicability only to evergreen forests, and here evergreen and seasonal forests are possible. So, meaning also forests, uh, deciduous forests, which show leaf shedding, will give uh, false positives in the optical approach, but not in the radar approach. Both approaches ideally need a forest mask, as they show false positives in agriculture areas here due to harvest or the change of fruits, fruit types. And here, basically, agriculture areas force positives there as well. However, they are mainly due to plowing or some, some structural changes. In the optical approach, a self-referencing step is involved, which is very important to allow interscene comparison. However, it restricts the detection of larger, larger disturbances. This is not the case in the radar approach. Here we have small scale and large scale disturbances detected properly the same way. However, here, the last point, um, the optical approach has some slight at the moment, you know, some slight advantage in a near real time component because a single event towards the end of the analysis period um, is sufficient to get um, to be detected. The same would not hold true for the radar based approach as a single event would be filtered out, but um, an additional um, monitoring time it's needed to confirm these these um, these signals. So here, if we talk, for example, for annual um, monitoring, additional three months are necessary to confirm these events. And my, my last slide, the outlook, research and development. On the one hand side, I would like to uh, tell you that we are working on combining the sensors within the FCLM tool. So not just Landsat, which is already shows a combination but also to combine Landsat and Sentinel, as well as the optical and the radar-based approach. Um, we want to improve the regrowth detections because, as I said before, ideally we have to work within forest masks. Regrowth, however, works outside forest masks and therefore we have to deal with false positives. And last but not least, the near real-time component should be improved for the radar-based approach, ideally while keeping the high spatial details. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniela Requena Suarez, and today I'm going to give you a short presentation about our work on improving estimates of above ground carbon sinks or above ground biomass change in tropical forests. As part of the 2019 IPCC refinement to the greenhouse gas guidelines, we updated estimates of above ground biomass change. And we did so by compiling research plot information in across all global ecozones in the tropics and subtropics and derived estimates for different forest types. For example, younger secondary forest, older secondary forest. When available, also we included information on managed and locked forest and also on old growth forests. As you can see in the image to the right, there are still a lot of uh, data gaps remaining for which we could not derive IPCC tier one level estimates of above ground biomass change. 
However, we were also aware that in the tropics and subtropics, several countries already had national forest inventories underway. And although NFI plot data usually has no information on time since establish forest establishment, forest age, or time since disturbance, we decided to obtain this information through the combination of NFI plot data with remote sensing time series analysis, and use this to estimate above ground biomass change in recovering or disturbed forests at a tier two level. In this presentation, I'm going to very quickly touch upon two case studies, the first one related to mainland Tanzania and the second one related to the Peruvian Amazon basin. For the first case study, we use the NFI plot information from the Tanzanian Forest Service, and we combine this with the methodology developed by TerraPulse to detect changes in forest cover. This detection of change involved detecting the changes in probability of forest cover using dense satellite time series of the Landsat archive for the years of 1984 until 2018. And from this uh, analysis, we could basically estimate the year since forest establishment for every single forest plot. As we integrated NFI plot data with uh, remote sensing analysis, we were able to distinguish between forests that had already been established before 1984 and forests that had been recovering from 1984 until 2018. We also included other environmental factors such as climatic water availability, topography, soil fertility, surrounding forest cover, uh, also the incidence of fire and the distance to roads and cities. And also we were able to, only for forests that had been recovering since 1984, derive an estimate of above ground biomass change. This estimate uh, suggested that on average, Recovering forests and woodlands in Tanzania are accumulating biomass at a rate of 0.4 megagrams per hectare per year. If you want to know more about our results or read our methodology, I invite you to check the study that I link in the bottom right hand corner. For the second case study, we integrated NFI forest plot data obtained by the Peruvian Forest Service with remote sensing time series analysis. We did this across the Peruvian Amazon basin and used an algorithm uh, recently developed, also known as Avocado, um, to detect years of disturbance and recovery, as well as frequency of disturbance and recovery events. Similar to the first case study, for this study, we also integrated our information with uh, gradients in environmental conditions and degrees of human use. And we were able to derive not only time since disturbance, which you can see on the right side of the slide, but also this degree of disturbance intensity, which you can also see on the left side of the slide. In this case study, we were able to assess not only above ground biomass, but also tree species diversity. In the figure to the left of this slide, we can see how levels of above ground biomass and also tree species diversity differ between disturbed and undisturbed forest plots, which is what we were expecting, that there's a lower biomass and lower tree species diversity in disturbed forests. And on the panel, to the right of this slide, we can see the effect that disturbance intensity has on above ground biomass and tree species diversity, which we were able to capture with the integration of NFI plot data and remote sensing analysis. As one would expect, higher levels of disturbance intensity uh, result in lower levels of above ground biomass and also tree species diversity. When looking at the effect of time since disturbance, we were able to um, observe that above ground biomass is increasing as time passes, uh, suggesting us that disturbed forests are accumulating carbon after a disturbance. And this accumulation was really not captured when we were analyzing tree species diversity, suggesting us that more research is needed and also as 
other previous studies suggest that the recovery of tree species diversity occurs at a different time frame than the recovery of above ground biomass. Based on the two case studies that I have mentioned, we can reflect on current and ongoing challenges. The first one related to the complexity of detecting disturbance and recovery in dry forests and woodlands, such as was the case for the first case study. Um, dry forests and woodlands tend to have lower levels of biomass than other forest ecosystems, for example, tropical humid forests. Therefore, detecting their change is far more complex. And then the second point also related to remote sensing time series analysis of forest uh, dynamics is the detection of the type of disturbance. So are we looking at natural disturbances or are we looking at human in those disturbances. Having this type of information would be very relevant for our future analysis. There is also the challenge of availability of ground data, which is currently being tackled both from the research plot side of, uh, of this, but also by countries through the development of NFIs. And finally, there is the challenge of uh, how can the estimates that we are deriving from our studies be included in national forest greenhouse gas reporting. Many thanks for listening. I am very interested to see what comes out of these discussions. And if you have any comments, suggestions or questions, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Good afternoon. This presentation has been prepared by Conan Vasily Obam, myself, Catherine Jeffrey, and my colleague, Danai Maniatis. Uh, Conan represents Gabon's national space agency, Agios. Danai and I are both consultants working under the CAFI program, uh, supporting Gabon in the creation and submission of its first Red Plus forest reference level to the UNFCCC, as well as crediting levels under different Red Plus financing mechanisms. And today we'd like to share some experiences arising from this work where further research could help refine measurements for sequestration and forest degradation and improve the accuracy of the country data used to engage with different uh, Red Plus financing mechanisms. Some brief context first. Uh, so Gabon submitted its first draft uh, forest reference level, FREL, uh, to the UNFCCC in January of this year. Um, the national FREL technical team is currently working on a modified version following UNFCCC review. This will be submitted in about two weeks time at the end of June. Uh, the FREL is a fairly complex one, um, as generally as FRELs go, and it accounts for both emissions and removals in all five Red Plus activities. Parallel to this process, but using the same model and data, uh, $17 million of carbon credits have already been generated through demonstrated historical emissions reductions uh, via the Gabon CAFI partnership. So this is funding from the Norwegian government. However, more work is required for Gabon to be able to generate credits for removals. Um, also, as an HFLD country, it has become apparent um, that there are limited prospects for Gabon to continue demonstrating emissions reductions uh, for uh, carbon credits into the future and therefore Gabon is keen to cultivate opportunities for carbon uh, to generate carbon credits through a net removals approach. So to start with removals very briefly in order to measure uh, removals for its frel Gabon used remote sensing data that were generated by SERS um, using the semi-random sampling method um, so SERS generated for Gabon a series of land use change matrices um, where uh, all of the IPCC land use change categories were used and um, analysis was done for five year periods between 2000 and 2015 and then 2015 to 2018. So this was done uh, for four different national land tenure classes and these were logging concessions, protected areas, rural areas and all other land uses combined together. So these classes summed exactly to the total land area of Gabon. And from this, the FREL technical team extracted the data from the SERS matrices and put them into forest cover matrices in an Excel workbook, which was created specifically for the FREL, um, whereby, and you can see in this picture here, the area of standing forest that was detected for each assessment year uh, was interpolated with a simple uh, interpolation between assessment years. And those are the first four columns and the last column in that picture. And uh, this uh, that, that to provide an annual value of forest cover um, uh, over time. And then the area of newly regenerated forest that was detected for each assessment period was accounted for as the average annual change 
Um, so that's the orange columns, plus the cumulative area between assessment years, and those are the green columns in the middle. And so um, these data were organised by forest type, so each, each column is a different forest type, and calculated for each national land tenure class, and all of the totals matched up exactly, so was, the team made sure there was no double counting. And, and one of the biggest challenges that we faced with this method was with the fact that there were discrepancies in the area of forest cover between the start and the end years of each assessment period. And this was because the land tenure shapefiles changed in shape and size between assessment periods due to the history of administrative changes. Um, so to counter this, um, uh, SERS um, applied uh, a criteria whereby the number of PSUs uh, selected for land use change analysis was based on the area of the shapefile at the end of each assessment period. So therefore, for any given assessment year, so for example, 2005, the sampling effort at the end of each period, so the sampling effort at, at the end of the 2000-2005 period, differed to the start of the subsequent period, 2005-2010. And so within the frail matrices, it was necessary to reset um, the forest cover area values at the start of each assessment period. And this resulted in a kind of staccato effect of removals estimates over time, which is simply due to this me methodological artifact. And the second area of research that Gabon would like to mention today in relation to its frel is forest degradation due to shifting agriculture. Uh, this type of agriculture is common in the region, but not well understood in Gabon, both in terms of the surface area affected, of uh, forest converted, and also associated emissions or removals. Um, most agricultural activity data used for Gabon con it concerns industrial agriculture, simply um, uh, because shifting agriculture is harder to characterise. And here we have an example of one of the land use change matrices that were generated by SERS for Gabon. And you can see in the middle highlighted in red the areas of forest, forest converted to cropland. And most of this can be linked to industrial agriculture as it's the easiest form to identify with the remote sensing data. So it's a major research challenge to characterise shifting agriculture with remote sensing data. Um, this is because it's a very dynamic activity and there's quite a lot of confusion between uh, shifting agriculture and certain land use and land cover classes such as secondary forest and also there's considerable difficulty distinguishing between fallow land and low-lying vegetation. So Gabon's research gaps pitch is firstly concerning removals. It would be interesting and useful to address the issue of how to measure forest cover area change over time um, when the analyses are done uh, using national land tenure classes that change in area over time between the assessment years and also when the data are further subdivided by forest type. And secondly, concerning shifting agriculture, it would be useful to develop a methodology to characterise shifting agriculture, um, perhaps by using time series data of optical images or agricultural calendars or other types of data such as radar or, multispec or multispectral data. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jean-François Bastin. I'm a professor in ecosystem monitoring at uh, Liège University in Belgium. And today I have been asked to present uh, some challenges that uh, the scientific community is facing about uh, the restoration of, of tropical forest ecosystems. As a scientist, we, we sometimes tend to forget that we are uh, facing a common target a common issue, which is climate change and which is also the loss of, of biodiversity. Uh, I've been in the last two years, I've been reviewing dozens of papers about restoration. And I think that um, when I read the state of the art in the context of each paper, they all start with an opposition between global programs, global initiatives uh, on restoration and the local ecological restoration uh, on specific ecosystem. Uh, with specific species and specific uh, geographic locations. And I think that um, one of the problems is that the, the scientific community working at local scales tend to see those global efforts as the way they were uh, 40 years ago, uh, like big uh, top-down projects trying to, to work on, on a massive planting program to, to fight against desertification. And I think that uh, if you if you really read uh, and what 
uh, and you the report of what those projects are doing. This is absolutely not the case anymore today. So I really had to share with those scientists like those, th that kind of information to, to show that a lot of those uh, global initiatives are more today about supporting local initiatives, uh, respecting uh, endemic biodiversity and respecting uh, local communities' needs. Uh, but yet, it's still a gap that is important today that we are that we are facing as as scientists working on restoration. And I think also that on on the other end of the spectra, I think that um, global initiatives tend to forget the 40 to 50 years. Uh, of work that has been done in restoration ecology at the very local scale. And I think that clearly that there is a big gap between the two here that needs to be um, to be tackled. And I think that one way uh, to do that for the scientific community is to take our responsibility and to be able to do one step back to try to go out of debates which are not necessarily like the like the main debate that we have to face today in order to do two steps forward together, uh, in order really like to make sure that we are addressing uh, the common targets that uh, we are fighting together. So if I apply this uh, one step back, two step forward to myself, uh, we can start from the, the global tree restoration potential that we published uh, two years ago. It is clear that that paper generated uh, a lot of debate, a lot of questions, which shows that we are still far from an agreement about uh, our, our understanding of restoration ecology. I think there are still major questions, even purely methodological, that needs to be addressed, like what to restore, how to restore it, and, and, and where to restore it. In order to answer to this question at the global level, what we miss, I believe, is a global framework about restoration ecology that can be applied uh, for any cases of restoration. So I'm not pretending that I will be able to, to build it right here, right now, but um, I would like to, to share with you my thoughts about it. So if we illustrate the, the state of an ecosystem by its tree cover through time, and we start from today with an intermediate uh, level of tree cover, so this might be our point where we need to do to implement a restoration project. When we need to do so, the first thing that we do is to assess the potential state of the ecosystem that might be restored based on uh, different approaches. So this will be in the future, and we expect that ecosystem to be sustainable in the future. One thing uh, that is often missed from in, in, in the project, uh, but that is existing in the literature, is the fact that actually on, on each given location of the globe, we might not uh, restore only a single ecosystem, but we might restore different uh, ecosystem, alternative ecosystems. So this is something that is not yet well taken into account in projects and that should. So if we just simplify this here for the presentation, we just illustrate two potential ecosystems in the future, one with a higher tree cover, one with a lower tree cover. Um, this leads, of course, to different uh, restoration strategies, whether this is natural regeneration, natural assisted re regeneration, or if, uh, if it requires tree cutting or, or prescribed fire. And of course, uh, another thing here that will influence uh, the full strategy of restoration is the ecosystem legacy, whether we had uh, a high or a low tree cover uh, in the past. This will not define what should be the future, but this will influence what could be restored. This has definitely an influence on the seed bank, on the quality of the soil. And of course, um, another point that is very important is the degradation even process that happened that led to today's situation, whether this was uh, a deforestation event or an afforestation event. It is important to stress also that uh, the, in the future, the climate will be different from today and from the past, and the socioeconomic conditions will also be different. So it is, it is likely that the future state, the future stable state of the ecosystem, uh, might be different from the past state of the ecosystem. So I think that this is a like a graph that allows really to understand the complexity of of restoration ecology accounting for time, for climate change, for socioeconomic context, for several ecological theories. 
and we what is important here to understand is that we could build that graph like a different specific graph probably for each location of the globe in order to build a global understanding of restoration ecology it is therefore necessary to build a library with many scenarios of uh, restoration such library will help us to will provide uh, the necessary information to understand to guide and to monitor also ongoing restoration project and, and future restoration project but building that that library will not be easy like we can already start uh, from existing data from existing projects but uh, we still need to build a lot of knowledge uh, which will involve several fields in in science like we need probably to to develop more in modeling in the modeling of ecosystem and the response of the ecosystem to climate and climate change uh, we need also to develop a lot in, in experimental ecology so we need, we can work uh, in in climate chambers to to test the system the the resistance the resilience of different species to climate change and extreme climatic events but we need also to develop on the field big experiment to try to test the different scenarios like testing on one location uh, the restoration of of different uh, ecosystems trying to go into one location and trying to find different legacies of the system and to start from different legacies in order to restore different ecosystems we need like to develop all this expertise in order to guide uh, the restoration process so on my side uh, the little stone that I'm trying to bring to, to that scenario is to, to go back on my <coughs> potential tree uh, cover uh, results and to try to, to use a uh, new statistical approach in order to predict not only the potential tree cover on each given location, but also to predict the potential shrub cover, the potential grass cover, and the potential bare ground cover. So this should help to have a better idea of what was what possible in the past, what is possible today, and uh, what should be possible in the near future. I would like to finish my presentation with uh, this part of a sentence uh, that I took from the book on restoration ecology of uh, Palmer and colleagues, uh, where they stress in the conclusion that uh, the restoration practice should be ongoing and that it should keep pace with new knowledge. They say that in the sense that uh, the implementation of restoration action on the field shouldn't wait for the perfect science to be implemented. It should be implemented today. But uh, it should be flexible enough so that it can be adapted through time with the evolution of science. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any question, please uh, send me an email uh, on the email that you can see on the screen. I'm sorry, I cannot be there with you uh, today to respond live to the questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.